actually taking off from where we left things only one session ago. Um, so let's, uh, let's return to the question of, of human rights. Why, why does this question trouble Sayla, the question about uh, whether there is indeed a human right to democracy? Apart from the fact that it's denied by her, her adversaries in the chapter, uh, there is a, a good reason why it should trouble someone with Sailor's position. And that's because, as you were beginning to see, the idea of human rights uh, is in, uh, inherently bound up in Sailor's work with the notion of democratic iteration. Um, in order to have a filled out notion of the human rights of individuals, those rights have to be filled out in a specific way and in a specific context, and that's the context of communicative freedom, which can only exist in a democratic political order. And that gives rise, um, something that didn't quite come up last in the last session, but uh, I'm going to introduce it now, it gives rise to the notion of what Saylor calls uh, legitimate variation, right? So whilst there is this core idea, the core, the principle of right, which is the right to have rights, which forms the constraints on what, form, what constitutes a legitimate political order, a legitimate democratic order. Beyond that, in each democratic order, you will have variation on the specific rights and their content. They will be interpreted and contextualized in every context. But because they are hap that contextualization and interpretation is happening within a democratic legitimate order, then it will be a legitimate variation if those contextualizations differ from each other between different states, let us say. I'll use states shorthand for political order. Okay, so that's the view. Why is there a challenge from people like uh, the adversaries like Rawls and uh, Joshua Cohen in particular, and also Bites makes an appearance <laughs> with regard to uh, to the right to democracy. Well, the views that these individuals put forward, the views that these theorists put forward, are views of legitimacy. Right. So let's pin the question on legitimacy. What is it for a state to be legitimate, either in the international context or per se, and we, we need to clarify that actually down the road, whether it's a specific kind of legitimacy that we're <coughs> focusing on, but I'll, I'll use it in an open sense for now. And what they say uh, in different, slightly different ways is that in order to have a legitimate order, you do not need that order to be democratic, right? You don't, you don't need to satisfy rights to equal democratic participation or political equality, however you wish to, to voice that. Um, it's sufficient that other things are in place. I'm going to use rules as an example here. It's sufficient that a, a schedule of very basic rights, rights to freedom, uh, right, uh, to rights to protections of personal security, some right to subsistence goods to protect you from you know, suffering, sort of starvation and so forth. Uh, it, it's sufficient that, that well, on the one hand, you have this limited schedule of, of basic rights, and on the other hand, that the political order itself is what he calls well-ordered, which means, in the international sphere at least, which means that there is a system of law that applies a common good conception of justice, um, and that there is also some form of consultation procedure that takes place, a method of consulting the population about the political order, but not a method that, it, that can be analyzed into the notion of a majoritarian process that represents everybody's <coughs> sort of preferences um, in, in outcomes, right? It can be, there can be a, a lot of variation of what kind of procedures. But I, so you will note, in that notion of the conditions of legitimacy that I've just set out, there isn't the condition that it has to be democratic. It's precisely to avoid that extra condition that you have these other conditions put in. And similarly, Josh Cohen has a view that consists of identifying specific rights, um, but doesn't stretch as far as democratic legitimacy. Um, and similarly, also, with uh, Bites's, Bites's view for slightly different reasons, and I, I don't think we need to go specifically to those right now. Um, so this challenges the idea that you need, for, for to begin with, democracy for legitimacy of political orders, and, and here's where it, it cuts with, with Saylor's view, 
it challenges the idea that you need democratic legitimacy for human rights, right? Because they've described a view where apparently a state or a political <coughs> order can defend a schedule that they identify as this limited schedule that they call the human rights schedule, uh, and there's no need for democracy in order to defend it. Right? It's, it's perfectly uh, reasonable to see it in place, say, the views. So Taylor needs to show that this is problematic, that this way of trying to set up a notion both of legitimacy and of the protection of human rights, human rights standards by inst in, uh, political institutions just doesn't get off the ground. Um, and I guess there are, I, I, I've spotted sort of a couple of arguments that I, I'll quickly sketch that I think are the arguments that, that Shayla mounts against these views. Perhaps three, let's call them three arguments. Um, the first one is that um, given that these theorists seem to be concerned with self-determination, so they're not, it's not simply that they arbitrarily pick these list of human rights, uh, a judicial order that has a common good conception of justice and some form of consultation mechanism. It's that they're concerned with trying to identify the self-determination of political communities in, in the world. Um, that the idea that you can have self-determination without democratic guarantees, democratic participation guarantees, uh, and democratic rights uh, on, on Shaler's views is, is internally inconsistent. It's just not a, it's not a, it's a non-starter. In fact, she identifies three conditions that Joshua Cohen raises up as the value, uh, as expressing the value behind self-determination for a political community. These are the conditions of an accountability mechanism that takes into, that, uh, takes into account or responds to the interests of all members of the society that also there is some form of uh, possibility and protection of dissent for dissenting voices within the society. Um, and I think the third one, I haven't written it down. Um, here we go, yes. And the third one is that public officials um, should, should make decisions in light, uh, by reference to a conception of the common good. Okay, so that, pub that, that they are obliged to make transparent uh, justifications for the decisions they make, and those justifications have to be in light of a, a conception of the common good that's widely shared in society, widely accepted. These are Joshua Cohen's conditions, and Shaler's challenge is, well, show me a state or a society that can satisfy those conditions that's not democratic, and maybe you, you know, I'll, I'll listen to you, maybe you have an argument, but actually it sounds like the only way you could have that form of self-determination legitimacy is through democratic rights and democratic participation. Another argument against this minimalist view that tries to exclude the right to democracy is uh, that it will allow paternalist, conceivably allow paternalist regimes or benevolent despotisms to count as legitimate political regimes because they, they can satisfy these minimal rights conditions, these minimal well-orderedness conditions and yet still it be a society in which, for example, there is, there is some form of paternalistic rule from the top. Okay? And in fact, in Rawls' hypothetical or, or, or um, uh, imaginary example of the Kazanistan state, which is supposed to be an example of the kind of state he has in mind that could satisfy these conditions, uh, precisely the idea is that you have some kind of um, religious hierarchy, potentially, with some great figure at the heart of it, at the top, uh, which satisfies the other conditions and yet, uh, and yet exercises a monopoly on power. And that seems to be uh, incongruent with our intuitions about what legitimacy requires. <coughs> In addition to that, uh, Shayla also notices that on, on this kind of Rawlsian view, uh, it's consistent not only with these forms of uh, uh, um, uh, deformed political order, but it's also consistent with la quite considerable inequalities. Right? So Rawls's view is that so long as some basic rights are satisfied, uh, we don't need to make the rights uh, equal rights. Right? Some people can have more freedom of expression than others, say, mm -hmm. let's say religious freedom of expression. Some groups can get the right to uh, grants to build their religious 
uh, institutions, their religious, to build their religious buildings or their religious centers where other groups have nothing in, re in response. So you can have a, a quite a, uh, what potentially could be described a non-neutral approach to how we treat groups in society. And that also is considered to be abhorrent uh, on, on Shaler's view and a reason to reject this minimalist approach. Um, okay, so all that said, th those are negative arguments, right? If you go down this minimalist line, that's what you're going to get, and you're not going to be happy with that once you look at the, you know, the image of what you, you get at the end. It's not a nice image. I'm more interested in the positive arguments. Right? So although we can, we can come back to these negative ones. And the positive argument concerns um, exactly the, the relationship between democracy and, and human rights, right? Because if you, if you look at those arguments, identify independent faults with the views. But actually, the, the key, I think, is in relation to the discussion we had before, is the idea that on those views, you can't account for uh, a notion of legitimate variation in human rights standards in each society. And the reason you can't account for that is because um, without democratic rights in place, without democracy in place at, uh, of some kind, whatever variation you get in those societies won't be legitimated. Right? Um, whereas, in, Shaler accepts that on Rawls' view, there's, a, that they, there's space for a lot of variation. It won't be legitimate variation because it won't be underwritten by taking place within the context of a democratic uh, political order and the rights of that enshrines for its citizens. So, um, in order to have legitimacy, you need democratic iterations, you need the principle of right to be respected, uh, and you need the realization of those rights uh, in a juridical way that respects that principle uh, in, in a set of institutions that have come about within the context of a democratic order, mm. and those other views don't provide it. So, those views can't justify human rights for real, right? The human rights that people will really get in those societies because they can't justify whatever variant interpretation of those rights comes about in those societies. That's really the crux of, I think, the argument. It's that um, human rights need democratic iteration and those views by not providing it can't justify their schedule of human rights or any schedule for that matter that will arise from the views. I'm just going to finish by stating what I think are three possible lines of problem with the approach, with this, with this argument. Um, and the, f the first one is to say, um, and I'm, I'm going to focus on legitimate variation. Um, it seems to be, there seems to be to me, the possibility of making a distinction between the idea of what is required by human rights uh, in principle, and maybe even a variation in what that idea requires when you apply th those rights given practical con contexts. Right? So the right to life in one context may mean something different from another context because of the facts, because the circumstances have changed. But that doesn't seem to me to be tied to the notion of legitimate variation in the way that Shaler means it. Because you don't need to understand that variation. You don't need the notion of a political system uh, and a democratic order deciding the content of the rights. So it seems that there is another sense of legitimate variation, which is the variation in, in what rights you are offered or, or pro uh, preferred by your society, what rights your institutions are willing to supply to you. And it seems perfectly reasonable to say that it's legitimate for those institutions to uh, sometimes uh, offer you some rights and not others because of the democratic context in which the decisions about what rights you should have uh, requires it, right? comes up with that conclusion. It may be, for example, that balances are needed between your human rights and, say, considerations of practicality such as emergencies, stability, uh, and a number of other types of non-human rights-based considerations, and in order to arrive at a conclusion about how to balance it, you have to consult the body politic, right? you have to consult. But that question seems to be not the question about the content of human rights, but rather a question about what rights you can get in a given legitimate political order. 
So my question would be then, you know, does that is that distinction a false one on on your view, Shayla, or is it is it a legit? Is it a, a, does it seem to you a plausible distinction? And if so, in that case, are we not talking about two different things? Right? Are we not talking on one hand about human rights and and their variation because of context, and on the other hand, the variation of the application of human rights because of democratic other democratic imperatives? That's point one. Uh, the second point is about the right to have rights. Now, I, I was struck, and I, I, I liked Richard's four-part distinction, although I haven't quite held it all in my mind. I've held some of it. Um, and, and it sort of chimed with something I'd, I'd been thinking to say also, which is that um, there seems to be two sets of rights in play in the discussion, right? So we have the rights that define your membership, uh, and that they're the right to be a member, and it's constitute, and it, to be a member isn't just you get a membership pass, it's you get given certain privileges, right? And those are important in order to be a full member. Um, and then there are the rights that we then, as members, construct together through the democratic process. Uh, but both of them get named human rights throughout the, the book and the discussion. Um, and that seems to me uh, problematic because. Um, it would seem to be that only the, you, you, you would need to have a notion of the right to have rights type privileges to get into the club, right? What it is to be a proper full member of the club in advance of then setting out to discover what rights we have, uh, we can construct for each other within the club once we engage in the democratic procedure. Now, Shayla says, well, we can get, you know, this, this is important to get around this because. Um, it, it's not such a simple process. It's a hermeneutic process, right? We start. We have to make a first step before we can we can make any further. So we have to make a first step that might itself not be warranted before we make further steps. Once we get going, we can look back at this first step of de defi defining the rights that you have as a member and justify it retrospectively or incorporate it or whatever. Uh, the problem is that this, the first step, for sure. Any first step in, a, in a developing a theory of rights is going to be questionable and maybe has to be retrospectively integrated. But the first step in this case is the first step of a legitimate step. Right? What is it for a state to have a legitimate setup in the first place? And you can only then move to fill in the human rights content on the view once you have a legitimate setup. So you need that first, you need to have a very clear sense of what that legitimate setup is in advance of engaging with this. So you, you can't simply sort of get into the hermeneutic circle because in order to get into the circle game, if you like, you need to already have a notion of, of what are legitimate steps in order to become a member of the, the group that's playing the game. Let's put it in that way. Um, there, are, um, there, there are sort of a number of, of other issues with that, but if you, I mean, it, it's important to point out that although because the, the, the chapters that we've discussed so far don't specifically set out a set of rights, um, it's notable that actually in the chapter, uh, chapter seven in fact, Shayla does at one point set out a list. And it looks very similar to Rawls's list, a schedule of rights that are the right to have rights. They constitute the right to have rights. Um, uh, and the list is very similar to Rawls' list of these minimal rights, except for, of course, the addition of the right to participation and the right to equal political rights in, in the system. That's the addition. So in a way, it seems you can set out the right to have rights in advance and justify it in terms of what it takes to be a communicative, uh, to, to, to be able to enter into free communicative uh, relations with others. Um, uh, before we have to get into the democratic sort of filling in the content type game. So uh, it, that seems to me a little, a little worrying in terms of the structure of the view and it would be interesting to have sort of further clarification on that. I also noted that in passing, um, Amartya Sen's view that rights are distinct from their, their political and juridical manifestation uh, gets dismissed. And one example that Sen gives uh, is the right to be free from humiliation. In fact, in, in a sense view, it's public shame, but, but it, it, here it's presented as the right to be free from, from being humiliated. Um, and and, and sense is, well, we can have a perfect sense of what that right is without ever having to enter into the, the political 
game, right, of, of defining that right through democratic processes. <laughs> and and that's rejected by uh, that's rejected by Shaler, who says that uh, this perfectly makes sense as a negative moral obligation on others, not to shame you. But why call that a human right? And I I didn't quite understand what what that rejection was. But maybe we can get clarity. Why why would that be sufficient to reject this as actually constituting a human right? And I think I'm going to leave yeah, it there. Thank you very much. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm really uh, grateful for um, uh, for all this, uh, and it's helping me think uh, think along uh, very much. Um, this particular chapter um, is probably <laughs> written in uh, anger and sorrow. <laughs> um, it is it because uh, um, I respect uh, uh, Joshua Kahn's work so much, and I consider him a comrade in arms, and I could not quite um, understand why these, you know, why he was willing to concede that there was no human right to democracy. And and I explained it to myself in part uh, by the sort of the political context and what I said about the kind of dilemmas of Rawlsian liberalism uh, at that particular political moment after the catastrophe of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and this, you know, sort of. So there is, uh, there is that political. So, Maybe that explains a little bit why I'm uh, arguing in via negativa, that is to say that I engage in imminent critique, but I don't quite you know, uh, open my own cards or put the, my cards on the, on the table in the, in the chapter. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you've raised some very, very important systematic questions, and I feel that um, <coughs> in terms of the imminent laying out of the argument against uh, um, uh, Cohen in particular, it's a bootstrapping argument. I mean, if you've committed yourself to all this, then show me an example or, you know, just, okay. But let's turn now to, to the more systematic issues that, um, that you have uh, raised. And I see, I see three, um, and I want to come back to the question about variation, legitimate variation. Indeed, uh, this, is, uh, this is a theme that is running throughout the essays. And again, I have been troubled by the uh, lack of attention uh, to, this, uh, to this question, namely uh, that um, rights claims are such general abstract normative statements, as you say, you know, the right to, uh, the right to life that we do not spend enough time about, uh, let's call it their, uh, their uh, contextualization. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, does the right to life in the case of, let's say, a witness protection program, uh, would it involve uh, giving someone you know, extra uh, protection? on the part of the uh, state and other political institutions and whether that would come from the right to life or whether that would be the right to due process. I don't know the, you know, the jurists will try to attribute, but, but uh, we are constantly having this discussion about legitimate contextualization and variation. And yet much of the work that we do in theory is simply focused on those very general and broad statements. Uh, so this uh, has been a, pre, um, a, a concern, but it's also precisely related to the interaction between um, uh, the language of rights and democratic argument. And as we know, uh, there is uh, some kind of a wedge that has been driven in a lot of uh, discussions about the relationship of rights and popular you know, sovereignty or rights and democracy, and the one seems to be precluding of the other. So my um, answer and um, uh, here is building on an insight of, uh, of Habermas is about the co-originality of popular sovereignty of rights claims is uh, the way in which, uh, as you say, uh, the democratic conversation, once it gets going, is about the uh, iteration and reinterpretation 
uh, reinterpretation of this. So I make uh, democracy quite substantial, the democratic game uh, quite substantial to the legitimate variation in context. But you raise the other issue. You say, I think there are, you say there may be variations that arise from two other dimensions. One is variation that could arise uh, from um, a contextualization. And here, I think we need to know a little bit more about uh, do we mean um, uh, more contextualization, political contextualization, legal contextualization. I'm ready, I'm ready to agree to this. And I think we need to do uh, much more work in understanding, for want of a better word, the dialectic between the general and the particular and the kind of way in which our judgment always goes back and forth uh, uh, in a kind of reflective equilibrium when we talk about contextualization. We just simply seem to think that we know what it means. But we, we, we need to do maybe more precise work on what it means to properly, uh, to properly contextualize. Now, you gave an example, I would say an example of institutional contextualization, which is balancing. Uh, obviously, uh, 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 much of the democratic conversation is not only about the iteration of what these most abstract principles involve, but it's also about the proper, uh, the proper uh, balancing. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's again, uh, absolutely uh, uh, correct. Now, the task of the uh, uh, political, you know, philosopher thing is having appreciated all this. Um, how do we how do we retain maybe even a moment, you know, again of critical critical judgment, or uh, can we can we have such standards uh, at all? Um, we know, for example, that. Um, many recent judgments of the European Court of Human Rights that keep appealing to this margin of appreciation doctrine have been criticized, including the margin of appreciation doctrine that comes up again and again in the, you know, in the, in the, scarf, uh, in the scarf case. So if we are always already inside the conversation, do we retain any, any standards, any criteria? Well, sometimes I think the best we can do is use the internal or imminent criteria of the conversation and turn it against itself. I mean, in the case of you know the doctrine of the margin of appreciation, uh, you can really uh, ask uh, whether the uh, security interests of the state, the interests of the state in public order, should or should not trump uh, liberty interests and religious freedom interests, right? This is the this is the uh, this is the the uh, normal um, uh, the normal uh, uh, procedure. Now, in other cases, uh, and this goes back to something that I said uh, this morning, uh, you may, as a theorist, you know, if if you you do operate within the framework of discourse theory, you might have a more robust. Uh, uh, <laughs> to use again Reiner Force terminology, robust veto power for criticizing some of these balancing uh, decisions for being exclusionary, uh, limiting of the conversation rather than opening, etc. So that would be uh, just um, uh, trying to expand a little bit. Um, um, the um, uh, I don't want to gone too long here, but these are such important questions. You say that uh, <laughs> finally, <laughs> at one point, I give my minimal set of rights. So I, I have to, I have to just uh, for one second, please, I have to do this. That that this is a. Um, I try to distinguish between the concept and a conception, and I say minimally, the core concept of human rights would involve liberty, life, including. Liberty, I mean, freedom from slavery, serfdom, forced occupation, which is consistent with rules, <laughs> and here comes my expansion, as well as protecting against sexual violence and sexual, sexual slavery, right? I don't think that is there in the law of peoples. 
uh, the right to some form of personal property, who would disagree with that, equal freedom of thought, including religion, expression, association, representation, and the right to self-government. What is controversial is, of course, listing. I mean, uh, the core concepts that I give are not inconsistent with the UDHR. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights lists expression, association, representation, and the right to self-government. It's Article 24. It's only Rose's list that's more <coughs> minimal because of the specific task. But I do you know, admit, you know, not to admit, this is a feminist argument, and maybe this would have required an argument to include sexual violence and sexual <coughs> slavery as part of our understanding of defensible freedom rights or liberty rights. That is not you know, part of the UDHR in its present form. Now, um, you might be saying to me, well, Ben Habib, after all, aren't you sort of smuggling things in as well? I mean, what have you done? The list may be small, minimal. Haven't you smuggled some things in? Um, uh, my answer, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I have, uh, but... Um, uh, the reason why I think that this uh, uh, should be um, a, should enable me, you know, to uh, establish the dialectic with democratic iterations, is precisely because, except for that part on sexual slavery, what I have done is expand a core concept of human rights that is, you know, consistent with the most basic international human rights documents claiming also that they have a relationship you know, to uh, a communicative <coughs> freedom. I completely agree with you and um, that uh, I need to do more work, I didn't do it in this book, maybe to spell out the relationship between communicative freedom and some of the more specific <coughs> items. Maybe I took them to be a bit more you know, uncontroversial. I'm going on a little too long. I want to leave people, you know, room for, you know, conversation. Let us bracket Amartya Sen objection. Yes, I sure. think it stands. And you uh, raised a very important question about the problem of inclusion, but maybe I can take sure. that up Absolutely. in the context of um, uh, the discussion. Otherwise, I feel as if I'm just going to go on and on for the whole. Okay. Um, should we finish at 1.30? What do you want to do? Yes. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay, fine. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, so just a quick question of clarification. Going back to Saladin's remarks on uh, Richard's fourfold distinction of how human rights relates to the right to have rights, and just to see whether the way I understand it makes sense and then also connects to the issue of democracy. <coughs> so I understood human rights as being those, call them socio legal guarantees, that are needed to implement, so to speak, the right to have rights. So you first have the right to have rights, and then say you look at a number of possible worlds, and then you ask, in which worlds are, is this right to have rights respected? These are the worlds in which there are going to be those socio-legal guarantees that we might call human rights. <coughs> so I thought that when you said it's a matter of articulating the right to have rights, those, those socio-legal guarantees that allow people to make rights claims vis-a-vis -vis each other and express and have their communicative freedom protected. That was the structure as I understood it, but maybe not. There's a variety of different possibilities. And if that's the case, then it seems to me that whatever, and this is in line with what Saladin was saying, whatever the output of, the, um, of our communication under circumstances in which our right to have rights is protected is, cannot itself count as a human right or as a matter of human rights. It's just going to be some other kinds of rights that we define within our political community. <coughs> human rights come before. Is, this, I think, is fully in line with one of the comments that Saladin said. I just wanted to press you a little bit more on that and see whether you'd be happy to embrace this structure or there's something in the structure that is not quite consistent with the rest of your views. Um, 
I am needing to ponder this a little bit, a little bit more, and the fourfold discussion because this is these are very fine, uh, very fine distinctions, and um, a, I say in. Uh, oh, uh, let me begin this way. It is not simply the case uh, that uh, human rights are, as you put it, or, you know, and I don't think quite as Saladin was saying, is just simply the iterative articulation of whatever, you know, political <coughs> system, the, the social legal, you know, guarantees uh, that are. I mean, these are, uh, these are um, uh, principles that constrain as well as resulting from specific legislative decisions. I mean, uh, uh, currently, I may be misunderstanding something, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, currently, I mean, one of the big debates that you're having in the UK is about the repatriation, or whatever it is called, of the European Charter of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, correct? And there is a, there is a huge uh, conversation and discussion uh, going on about the various articles of this chapter. One thing that's of interest to me is was, for example, I was reading the contentious debate about the rights of the felons, where the UK, you know, sovereign legislature is, is resisting uh, the formulations of the, you know, European Charter, that, you know, the felons' voting rights should not be, should not be taken, uh, taken uh, away. Um, uh, uh, from the convention, not yeah, pardon, convention, convention, yeah. convention <laughs> yes, convention. Thank you. So, whether or not felons' voting rights should be re should be removed. Now, when you look at the logic of a, a conversation of this uh, of this kind, on the one hand, you have a very strong uh, human rights claims, namely that civil felony uh, should not result in the elimination of you know political uh, voice. Uh, as a, a democratic theorist, I would support that, but I would have to make an independent standing argument to be able to uh, support uh, uh, that, uh, that claim. Uh, so there is a way in which uh, human rights uh, uh, claims, uh, forgive me for using this term, have also a context transcending pull that it is not, they, they can't just like be output, they can't be results of output uh, output legitimacy. So that the claim of the, uh, the uh, right uh, to have rights, once that recognition is you know, also granted, has always, uh, that rights claim has always a way in which you know, to push uh, uh, that uh, context to further justify itself, you know, that's why, again, I mean, if uh, I were simply identifying human rights with the social legal entitlements of any popular mm -hmm. democratic sovereign, that would be a form of sophisticated legal positivism. What would it be? Maybe, I hope I haven't misunderstood you, but, you know, because you're looking a bit... <laughs> to, to be. Another question over there. As I 
I, um, uh, uh, I, may, I try to make a very limited argument uh, uh, there, and I'm happy to try to uh, clarify it because, of course, I uh, um, uh, uh, have learned a lot from Sen's work and his attempt to try to also open the question of contextualization and judgment uh, is very much uh, is very much sympathetic to me. Uh, please understand this as a very limited argument that comes in the context of Sen's interpretation of uh, Martha Nussbaum's approach to capabilities. And the only, really, it's you know what I contest here. It was not even the you know section in the recent book. It was an article called "Elements for a Theory of Human Rights," I believe. You know, and there was. Um, I felt that a distinction needed to be made, uh, which Sam was not making, uh, between human rights as moral rights and human rights as uh, moral claims that push towards um, political or juridical entitlement. And I felt that when he gave the example of you know public uh, shaming, I am sure there are cases, you know, if you consider maybe, you know, some of the laws r related to, you know, adultery practices in Pakistan and maybe even Afghanistan where, you know, a woman has to have three males, you know, and maybe one testify that, you know, a, a rape has been committed or adultery. Uh, clearly, there may be aspects there of public shaming that clearly bear on fundamental human rights to equal uh, protection of the law and to due process. But simply in the context of that particular article, I thought that there was a kind of insufficient distinction that Sam was making between uh, moral harm and rights claims. And so that is the, that is the, the, the way it really, it really was not, uh, <laughs> But uh, I have to I have to write something longer on his idea of justice. I really I really I really should. So I just want to be very humble about this and say you continue. Right. Um, any more questions? Yeah, over there. So I, I wonder how strong a notion of democracy is implied by the right of democracy. Is it you could argue if, if there was a human right of democracy, you could argue that the US political system at the moment um, does not fulfill human rights because of campaign financing. So it, it, th there's very strong differences there, right? And then Cohen's ca claims, ca claims kind of come in again. I mean, you argue that it shouldn't be about justifying intervention, but arguably that is possibly one role that human rights play, and if that is the case, then it might be that if you had a very strong right to democracy or human right to democracy, then an intervention into the United States as it is right now would be justified, which is probably an unacceptable um, conclusion. So I'm wondering. Not as far as I'm concerned, you can take the Supreme Court, at least four of them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's just being recorded. <laughs> it's all right, we, we'll edit it out later. <laughs> Um, uh, several uh, uh, several questions. Are the campaign finance laws a violation of human rights? No. It is certainly the case that I think that uh, human rights language and uh, civil and political rights language are really quite slippery. The freedom of association, the right to representation, what are those? They are also civil. Uh, civil rights and political rights. So there's not a very, very, very sharp line. And in many cases, I think human rights get translated into the civil liberties of duly protected citizens. So what you're dealing with, with the Citizens United decision in the, uh, in the you know, United States is like, you know, yeah, output legitimacy, because the Supreme Court has the right to do that. But, you know, we can we are making the argument that, in effect, that this is uh, so damaging to uh, the equality of political liberty that you know it is distorting the democratic process. But I think one can make both a normative argument 
based on you know, uh, freedom of association and speech. One can also make a kind of imminent argument in terms of the norms and ideals you know, of American uh, democracy. Uh, clearly, uh, the concept of democracy here is left a little bit uh, to the understanding and intuition of the reader. And um, you know that's always the difficulty a little bit of the essay, essay form. In one footnote, which I'm very fun, fond of, I talk about John Dewey. I know you. I know it's just like it's, and I say um, there are a lot of misconceptions. I mean, you know, one of the ordinary misconceptions is identifying democracy with majoritarianism. Clearly, uh, this is argued against throughout the book. But the reason why I like uh, Dewey's definition of uh, uh, democracy as the solution to collective problems via united cooperative human intelligence, which opens up, opens up a whole range of institutional questions and captures something about the spirit, um, uh, the spirit uh, of democracy. But um, um, you know, much more should have been said about this final point, the question about intervention. I feel very strongly about this, so let me say some things. You know, um, uh, there, there really um, is um, a mistaken understanding uh, about what international law permits out there. So let's just begin with this. It's not going to resolve the political questions that we are facing, right? About you know, in terms of just simple, you know, international uh, law, and uh, uh, the Genocide Convention is the only one that creates universal jurisdiction of genocide uh, and what are called use cogens norms, ethnic cleansing, massacres, uh, slavery, and possibly enforced. Uh, enslavement. Uh, international law is quite limiting in terms of what is justifiable conditions of intervention. Our world has opened up, and this is uh, partially the consequence of uh, becoming one globe, this whole dilemma of so-called humanitarian interventions opened up by security, one Security Council resolution, one uh, for, one against. It began with the US intervention in um, uh, at the uh, late state Yugoslav war, the uh, Sarajevo. It began with this, right? And there are developments now that are going way beyond international law as it is laid out in the UN system. We are just like reinventing things. That's why there was the you know commission established by Kofi Annan, you know, about uh, conditions of uh, humanitarian intervention. And you can also see the pressure of civil society. You know, uh, the British newspapers that I've been reading are full of ads from Oxfam, from Médecins Sans Frontières, and so on about Syria. You know something? I may have seen only two ads in the New York Times in the last you know, six months since the Syrian wars, uh, Syrian -led civil war started about this. Now, uh, I'm not saying something about the UK or the US here. It's interesting <coughs> that there is also the civil society pressure here, which you know, we are all you know, feeling. And there is the more moral dilemma that one feels, you know, this is the cosmopolitan predicament. And that's when, you know, um, beyond interventionism and indifference, uh, what do we do as political actors? What is open to us? You know, what what uh, what space is permitted there? You know, so um, uh, and no, I don't think uh, that even if I argue that democracy is a human right, there is no international legal legitimation for intervention to transform other regimes in a democratic way. There are only very minimal threshold of intervention, but the question is, what about engagement? There's a lot more that we can do. There's a lot more that we, so, but you see, this gets us into the real, the dilemmatic politics, uh, uh, you know, that's so much behind, uh, behind the essay, so. So, yeah. But that kind of begs the question because Cohen 
Cohen wants to know whether we can morally justify intervention or not. And your answer is it's not at the moment justified by international law, uh, which is surely right. And I also think that regime change should never be justified. But that's exactly why Cohen is pushing this point, right? Because we, maybe we as philosophers, maybe, maybe not we as philosophers, but at least we as citizens or world citizens need to be able to find moral reasons for justifying or not justifying intervention in some sort, right? One, uh, one quick answer to this. Now, I like your, your line of questioning very much, and I'm glad that you are you know, pushing me, because this is the cosmopolitan conundrum. Uh, it is not just that easy to say that's what international law says now and it may change subsequently because the laws of war and peace are the closest that we have and minimum human right is the closest that we have to anything like you know public international law in our in our world and of course uh, uh, so whatever arguments we want to make and you know and at the end of this chapter, I say maybe we have to look at something like a law of humanitarian interventions, right? Uh, but uh, we need to be um, very aware of um, creating so many exceptions, okay, in terms of strong moral arguments that uh, we destroy, you know, whatever, you know, uh, fragile, fragile, you know, balance, uh, uh, balance, uh, and so, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> right. 